नमस्कार अठारे जी नमस्कार जूम जूम रिकॉर्डिंग ओके गुड मॉर्निंग टू वॉशिंगटन गुड आफ्टरनून टू पुर्तगाल एंड गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल इंडियन फ्रेंड्स आई एम डॉक्टर प्रोफेसर विवेक गुप्ता I'm sorry for seven minutes late because I just finished an angioplasty. Uh, it was an acute coronary syndrome, and then I had a PP kit and everything to be taken off. So I was a little late. Can you hear me? Everybody can hear me. Hello, Baba. Hello. Hello, Mr. Sir. Namaste. Can I hear you? Can you hear me? Ah, Mr. Sir, you can hear me. Ah, Mr. Sir, you can hear me. Ah, Mr. Sir, you can hear me. ओके ओके सो आई विल नमस्कार नमस्कार मेरे गांव में कंट्रोल दिखा दिखा ना बात नहीं की हेलो हां नमस्कार 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 ओके सो आई हैव टू स्टार्ट माय प्रेजेंटेशन ओके सो गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून एंड गुड इवनिंग सो दिस इज द सेम स्टाइल व्हिच डब्ल्यूएचओ डायरेक्टर Dr. Andrea also is speaking whenever he is taking a conference. Okay, so I am Professor Dr. Vijay Gupta. This is the fifth webinar in series. Uh, this is Indo-European hosted a program, and I am thankful to uh, Dr. Fayaz Shaw. Let me introduce. He is the one of the oldest friend of mine. One of the very aggressive interventional cardiologist working in Washington University as a professor of medicine and cardiology. He has done almost all the all the all the type of interventions, including TAVI and everything. then uh, i introduce dr costo uh, pinto who is my friend and he is a immediate past president of european society of cardiology and he is working in lisbon in the in lisbon university is a health department and dean of faculty as far as i my room then i have to inv- i have to uh, uh, say hello to prof- uh, our minister honorable minister mr ramdas athawle ji he is a minister of social justice and em- empowerment in uh, he based out of bombay and pune but he is uh, a good friend of ours and he is working with government of india and a good friend of our prime minister mr narendra modi ji then we have dr ashokan who is our friend uh, from a uh, long time is there he will be speaking then dr pp bohanan he is a cardiological scientist of india president elect and uh, he is from trichur he is head of department of cardiology in trichur dr pk ashokan is from uh, kerala uh, calicut then we have dr mansoor ahmed who is joining in and dr our friend dr satinder singh from bareilly he is our my batchmate and uh, a the good friend is orthopedic surgeon so i have seen as of now we can see these people and we have other people who join dr kalmat from bombay and dr uh, uh, dr kalmat from bombay i think this is a, this is the whole list yes okay so dr chinmay gupta will give the vote of uh, thanks and mr vinay choudhary will be singing few songs in the end So let me start my presentation. Uh, this is 13th of May. I will share my screen. Uh, so the presentation is similar. Doctor Thavle has Mr. Thavle has already seen, but I will try to reduce myself because then we have a Doctor Professor Shaw, and I have been. I want to tell you that this presentation is also is also uh, live on the Doxy Plex Doc Plexus, which is a platform where where more than thirty three point eight lakhs doctors are participants in that. Secondly, this presentation, this live webinar, is live on Facebook Live on my side, and also live on Indians in Paris, which has twenty five thousand uh, almost participants. how many will be joining will come to know later so we are thankful to docs plexus to allow the streaming live on their platform where 
3.8 lakhs doctors are are the participants so coming back to my presentation uh, again good morning and good evening and good afternoon uh, sars covid 2 covid 19 corona virus disease i want to tell you that i would be speaking little more general because we have few participants on the facebook especially who are non medical for them to understand so as of today with uh, may 13th i have i forgot to talk, introduce dr tr raghu who will be joining soon is the president of indian college of cardiology which is another important body other than cardiological society of india so as of today 43 lakhs people are infected worldwide and more than 3 lakhs death around 3 lakhs death from global global perspective india started uh, screening a little later but as of now despite the best of the testing we have 75000 patients infected today this is from who and around 2500 deaths which is still a concern india has yesterday prime minister modi ji had announced that they will be having a lockdown for from from may 18 which will be a little different because there's some relaxation but as of today india is having around 3000 fresh infections every day which is not a good news in general so coming to the american perspective america is number one always because as you see that the first important economy and they have more than 14 lakhs patients infected and about 83000 death this is from today who just now live i have taken the figures uh, economic burden is i have not taken the portugal with dr pinto will tell us what is the situation there but dr pinto will talk more about the european perspective because he is the immediate past president of european society of cardiology so i really welcome him and he is one of the senior most person in europe as far as cardiology is concerned yesterday only our prime minister announced 2 lakh crore package which is 1 10% of our total gdp and therefore it is a very important package which has been announced for the corona virus disease treatment facilitation of research and of course to the poor people and just now 3 lakh crore collateral free loans has been announced by our finance minister this is just now so coming to the presentation this is just photograph taken just half an hour back so we did a cat angiography and we did a adoc endoplasty i want to try like to tell you that in the our cat lab apollo hospital has a protocol that they will admit the patients only only when the covid 19 test has been done except for the very serious cases so this patient was tested negative and we took him the cat lab you can see the pp half pp shield which we were never using i was in fact never using my even the face mask while doing endoplasty as you know all of the world many people are not using face mask or even the head mask so this is how we do it so this is just now about half an hour back we finished an angioplasty tight leader with the in the distal mid to distal led was causing acute coronary syndrome and after the stent you can see because this is just now half an hour back so i thought let me share with you and i immediately copied i took a photograph with my mobile and copied on the this powerpoint presentation so coming on to the disease virus is a viral disease it infects the lung mostly and there are a lot of things coming up soon and people initially said that it is only in the lungs but now we all know that the virus is infecting the cells in a in a worse way and corona virus it enters and replicate it's a s protein it leads to antigen and antibody formation and then the virus after the entry enters it transfers to polyproteins and structural protein after which viral genome begins to replicate uh, not going to major details but i want to tell you that the vaccine is depending upon the antigen presentation while antibodies are helpful for protection whether it is a plasma treatment or it is a herd immunity so this is all about this humoral and cell immunity is similar like igm and igg production happens and sars specific igm antibodies they disappear at the end of 12 weeks while the igg antibody can last for longer time uh, cytokine storm is the end stage and this leads to lot of cytokines are released and this leads to acute respiratory distress syndrome that is why about 7% death in general and five, more than 15% death despite the ventilation in elderly population the so cytokine storm will trigger a violent attack with the by the immune system and leads to ards and multiple organ failure and finally lead to death the clinical diagnosis is mostly because of the infection coming from cough and fever and dyspnea but the most important diagnostic test is pcr test and we all know that this test takes about 8 hours to 24 hours for the test to come the real time quantitative collagen reaction this is the this is the test which is done from the throat swab from the respiratory secretions 
not from the blood, while radiological diagnosis is coming from the CT scan, which is basically a ground glass appearance. And to tell you that's very important that sometimes, despite having the classical symptoms, patient may have a negative RT-PCR test. And in those tests, in those patients, this is auxiliary diagnosis because CT scan is a always positive. This is what is there. So testing is key to success. As of now, India is testing about 1,100 people per million, while Germany has been doing the best. I don't know Portugal. Germany has tested about 25,000 people per million, while America has tested about 8,000 per million. USA. This is by PCR test. So as when you are testing more and more, in Delhi as such is, is testing about 1,500, but in general, India is testing about 800 percent per million only. Antibody test has come, and I give this today news uh, morning. And IV National Institute of Virology Pune has developed India's first COVID-19 antibody testing kit. As we all know, Indian Council of Medical Research has actually returned the testing kit which came from China because it was too fallacious and faulty, and there were too many false negative and false positive tests. The Niti IO plans to make India COVID testing superpower with the private help, and they want to do at least 1.25 lakhs RT-PCR tests per day. The majority involves the use of the imported kits as of 9th May news. Testing involves bringing scientists and laboratories in touch with the private firms. So not going to details and this is the testing is rapid antibody test from China was found to be futile. It was returned back to China. It was a huge investment. Fortunately, government had not paid at that time. How the medicines work? The medicine, there is no specific medicine as of now. There is no specific medicine which can really kill the virus except for in vitro, in vitro ivermectin. Just for the interest of the people who are audience who are not medical, the virus inserts into the cells and at that point of inhibits TMPRS2 prevents viral cell entry and hydroxychloroquine works at the level of membrane fusion endocytosis while the important drug remdesivir, this works at the level of RNA dependent polymerase. Coming on to the hydroxychloroquine, much hype has been created when Mr. Donald Trump who was actually a guest in India on 24th February, my birthday, <clears throat> later on realized that this is not the actual flu. Initially, he took it very lightly and he thought this is just a flu, so don't worry. But later on, he realized that he was asking and requesting our Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji to, to curb the... At, at that time, Indian government had done a curb on the export of hydroxychloroquine. So he requested and finally a lot of hydroxychloroquine was exported out of India. Let me tell you, there is some still doubtful. Indian has India Indian Council of Medical Research about three weeks or one month back had actually announced that this should be used as profile access for all the healthcare workers. Profile access and the dosage was very simple. This was the guideline came as I cannot read it, but I want to tell you the 400 milligram of hydroxychloroquine once only, twice a day, only for one day, and then followed by 400 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine once a week for seven weeks. This is an Indian Council of Medical Research guideline in India. A lot of healthcare took, workers took it and there are still a lot of healthcare workers. Because then there was doubt created by QTC interval by cardiologists that cardio cardiac patients cannot have it unless you are very sure that QT interval is normal. So now today as, of, as a cardiologist, I always do the ECG. If QTC is normal, we would allow the patient to take as a profile axis. But at the same time, I want to read, this is French, French doc, virologist Didier Marseille. Uh, so what he said in this is a French study in February 2020. He was laughing on Chinese. He said, this medicine should not be used. It's a more cardiotoxic. But at the same time, he started a study and about 1061 patient from Marseille published on April 9, it shows that no major cardiac toxicity from this study. A good clinical outcome and virological cure was obtained in 91% patients and death only was 0.47. The patient who were treated by combination of hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. So this was a landmark study and therefore everybody started using, but there was some American study later on which came that this is more lethal. So not to go into details, but I would say that in Apollo Hospital Delhi, even the Chinese study which was published in February, they said that in the absence of any major word, major medicine against virus, it should be used with caution. And later on, FDA also said on 20th March, 
and it should be used as an emergency medicine in the patient who are not getting improvement and they are getting sick day by day. April 25, again, the US FDA said the similar thing. I don't know what Europe is showing, but I think they are following the guidelines coming from France by virologist saying that it is 91% effective. So leaving the, this part alone, hydroxychloroquine useful for prevention for healthcare workers and those who are on the field. While it should be used in all COVID patients, our hospital is using it. We have 81 beds. In Apollo, Delhi, we have 81 beds reserved for COVID-19. And despite that, all the beds are full and we have a waiting list now. Role of Imervectin, only one word to say, this is an anti-parasite medicine which is approved by the FDA, approved as a broad spectrum anti-parasite agent. But it is only in, it's the only drug which has shown high efficacy as an antivirus, but that is only in vitro. That means no human trial has been done, so we can't use it. Remdesivir is a very important medicine, antiviral medicine, recently approved by FDA, Federal Drug Administration, as important because the study has shown that this is very useful antiviral medicine and the experimentally results are available. Antiviral medicine given by infusion previously failed as an Ebola treatment but showed a promise against certain coronavirus in animal studies. Now it is an approved by as an emergency use by FDA. Remdesivir. Coming on to the mask, this is very important. I would like to give another one or two minutes because I'll have to finish in five minutes now because Honorable Minister will have to leave. I will take Dr. Fair, Dr. Pinto and then the Honorable Minister and Dr. Fayashwal, if he agrees with like that, we'll see. So mask is very important. When it came in December 2019, people did not worry. In December, January, February, March, everybody thought March. When the March came, I'm talking of March 2020, people felt that mask is very important. And 26 March, my interview on television, I was little, at that time, nobody was allowed to say. There was no such meaning that everybody should use mask on the road. This is important for Dr. Fayashwal to listen what I said on March. So I said on 26 March, March, mask for everybody who is going out. At that time, there was no such guidelines. So this was, I used the word Amocha at that time and very fortunate at that time. Later on, even Honorable Prime Minister used Amocha that everybody was going out, should be using it. It can be airborne. We don't know a symptomatic carrier. So we were not sure at that time, but at that time, I felt that this is important. So this was all about that. Mask, everybody has to use it. Vaccine and offering. Every day we are thinking that vaccine will come there. there. A lot of young people, everybody feels that vaccine is the treatment. There's no doubt it's a preventive. More than 70 vaccines are being tested worldwide, 70 vaccines. But there is not even a single finished human trial. As of today news, it will take at least 12 months or six months, at least six months for the, having the vaccine to market it out. So not going to major details, uh, there was a vaccine which came, what is vaccine for the interest of the or normal audience? It is an antibody, which, sorry, antigen, which is inject, injected as a preventive medicine like BCG or for polio or for cholera. And this helps in preventing the infection to be set in inside the body, something like herd immunity. Israel offered monoclonal antibody recently, but this still they have not introduced into the market. Monoclonal antibody will be for utilized for the treatment, not for prevention. But Italy has started recent trials, which was initially, this is updated on May 6. A team of Italian researchers claim that they have started the trial. But the most, most, most important, most important trial which was human trial, the first to be started was Oxford University and Pioneer Oxford, where most scientists have said a vaccine is not expected in the market before two years. But the trial, human trial, have started, and that was Oxford. Today, Boris Johnson, yesterday, has spoken, and he said COVID vaccine may be more than one year away. And he also said that Johnson has warned that in the worst case scenario, a vaccine may never be found. So this is a very bad news from where he's heard, and I hope that vaccine will come. This is today's news. I take in the article from the morning here. So I'm not good. More, there are so many vaccines, Novavax, Biotech, Pfizer, Schengen, more drug children, no Evonio, pharmaceutical, casino. These are to tell you about the few things. Contact tracing. Coming on to the contract tracing app. I will request everybody who's listening that everybody should download this app on the mobile. This is one step ahead. 
वन स्टेप अहेड ऑफ सोशल और फिजिकल डिस्टेंसिंग एनीबडी हु हैज गॉट आरोग्य सेतु ऐप डाउनलोडेड ऑन द मोबाइल विल गेट एनी इफ ही कम्स इन कांटेक्ट विद कोविड-19 पेशेंट इवन विद इन 14 डेज द पर्सन विल बी एबल टू नो दैट दिस पेशेंट हैज गॉट कांटेक्ट एंड देयरफॉर ही शुड क्वारंटाइन हिमसेल्फ a uh, recovery trial is very important trial for the, all the medicines coming up with by the european study especially for the antiviral medicines repurposed medicine what do we mean by repurposed medicine repurposed medicines are those that mean the medicines which are already available in the market for some other purpose can be used and you should be tried for corona virus this without having major antiviral studies so new drug has been proposed by my father uh, dr ml gupta uh, one of the new repurposed drug the patent is pending in indian council of medical research my father has been an active researcher he has done more than 200 research papers his research has still been today cited in google scholar scars and this protocol he is one of the repurposed drug without naming that is still pending in icmr to be used and maybe few days later one of the repurposed drug can be used for this plasma treatment for the sick patients we take out the blood from the patient who is recovered from covid 19 antibodies are taken out and infused in the patient Who is this? This is still investigational, according to Indian Council of Medical Research, not used. Uh, it's a law. We have still lost few patients despite plasma treatment in Delhi, but it is one of the big hopes, especially for those patients who are dying. Herd immunity is immunity which normally every virus gets, and that is has to be. This is the final answer. Stockholm, Sweden, actually is dependent upon this. I was told that they do not have a lockdown because they felt that let everybody get infected. and they will have immunity this is how the diagram shows that then everybody gets infected but this is not true for this corona virus covid 19 because because this is a highly contagious number one one person can infect around 450 people and secondly it can kill lot of people it is highly infectious and it is a high mortality so we will not depend upon herd immunity as far as my medical science says and we have to have vaccine or some medicine which should actually be working ventilator treatment is very important for all the patient who become sick and they require it we have isolation icu and isolation ward coming on to the healthcare workers lot of people have died worldwide that is why indian council of medical research has said hydroxychloroquine should be used use mask n95 take care use ppe when you are directly treating the patients and therefore we have to be very very careful role of china a one professor tasaku honju from japan nobel laureate there was Calculated whether it was a fake news or it was a correct news, he said that this virus is actually man-made. And he said, even if I die, if I proved un uncorrect, I should be allowed that my Nobel Prize should be taken back. But later on, he himself withdrew. April 28, he said he never said like this. But of course, every day Donald Trump, Mr. Donald Trump, is accusing China that this is something. And since China is not allowing investigation, there is always a doubt that something is wrong. covid and heart i will not going to detail because this is the topic of others my last slide will show that how many patients actually die when the patients have got uh, uh, high blood pressure or diabetes when the comorbid condition is there then the mortality is high uh, let me find out this is the last slide if the patient more than 80 years 8% mortality more than 80 years 50% mortality with cardiovascular disease 10% mortality with diabetes 7% mortality so the mortality is very high and this is the despite the best treatment on ventilator in icu so we have to be very cautious of this virus still the disease is not clear people say that it is actually working in a different way it is pro thrombotic it leads to acute mi it leads to uh, several others uh, reactions in the body it does not is not causing simple pneumonia so finally i really want to thank you for joining in and uh, if i see the time this is 7:30 pm i'm stopping the sharing now i can you can see myself and i have been told that honorable minister will stay till 8 o'clock only so i would request the honorable minister to stay a little more and i want to have at least two international speakers to speak when they finish off then i would like your messages for the public is it okay for you honorable minister sir yes sir main cha raha tha ki america ke jo doctor hai dr fayaz shaw pehle bol le uske baad dr pinto bolenge Yeah, Dr. Pinto, पहले बोलेंगे European से because it was in the serial with Dr. Fayaz Shaw, and then I would like you to speak. So can you stay till eight o'clock with us? 
So I request Dr. Fausto Pinto to please come with the slides. He is, I again want to introduce him. He's a personal friend, but he's a very big, very eminent scientist. Very, he's a dean of faculty. He's a professor of cardiology. He's a past president of very important society, European Society of Cardiology, which has more than 25,000 attendees. When the, this conference is held every year in Europe, this time it is planned for Amsterdam. We are not sure whether it is being held or not. So welcome, Dr. Pinto. I'm unmuting you. You can share the slides. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, to be here, and again, thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, it uh, um, it's really uh, we're living through different uh, times and very complex. We just show the give a very nice overview on uh, on COVID and uh, what we are facing uh, globally. This is really it's not a problem of a country or a region. It's a global problem, although with some differences uh, uh, across the world, but uh, at the end we're all facing the same issues and um, we're all trying to do our best to fight this, uh, uh, this very complex uh, situation. Um, I would try to give a little bit of um, um, an overview from a European perspective and I'll be happy to share some data with you and, uh, and also in the discussion we can have a little bit more uh, discussion on some topics that may be relevant for the uh, for our um, uh, for our meeting and for our discussions. We just showed the numbers, so I will not repeat that. Uh, just giving you a little bit of the numbers from Europe. We had the first case in Europe was in France, was in January 25th, and since then there has been a continuous increase in the number of uh, uh, infected patients. We do know that uh, there was a difference among uh, the different countries. Um, it started very, very badly, particularly in Italy and uh, Spain and then France and uh, the UK. Um, and, uh, and those numbers, if you look at the numbers uh, between the different countries, actually they vary uh, quite substantially, uh, not only the number of infected people, but also the number of casualties of uh, uh, the uh, fatality rate in the different countries. And that has to do a lot, and we can discuss that, on the attitude that uh, uh, the decision makers, the government took in different countries. In my country, uh, actually, we were uh, affected a little bit later. So uh, there was a chance to start some of uh, the measures to try to contain uh, the epidemic at an earlier stage. And our government, although uh, a little bit slower than we would like, but actually took the measures that we as scientific uh, community and medical community recommended the government uh, to take. And uh, I think that was the reason why uh, we have a very reasonable situation in Portugal. We have actually, uh, right now, we have about 27,000, 28,000 infected uh, and we, about 1,100 uh, uh, deaths, which is, uh, of course, it's always uh, not good to have uh, uh, casualties, but compared with Spain or with Italy or the UK or even some countries that had a more open strategy, and you just uh, what you were talking about herd immunity, and I totally agree with you, because I don't think that's the strategy for this kind of uh, virus and for this kind of infection. And even if you look at Sweden, for instance, which was more relaxed and more based on this uh, um, herd immunity, actually they have a very high fatality rate. They have over three thousand uh, deaths already. Uh, with a very high um, fatality rate compared with uh, with other countries, and even the UK, they started also with a strategy of herd immunity, and then they had to change, and uh, very fast. But still, they're still facing very hard times with very high infection rate and very high also fatality rate, with over thirty thousand people killed already uh, just in the UK. Here you can see in this uh, uh, in this graphic, you can actually see. The, um, the main peak uh, average in Europe occurred in, in April. And now what we are facing is actually in most of the countries is actually a decrease in the number of uh, uh, infected people and also in the uh, fatality rate in the, uh, in the different countries. And of course, as you know, there were very severe measures that were taken in many countries like lockdown. Of course, uh, all the different activities were very much closed. 
um, not only the ones with gathering of large number of people, but even you know at the at the more local level, there were a lot of restrictions. Again, a little bit different from country to country, but overall, there were a lot of countries with lockdown. We had lockdown until just a, a, a week ago, and uh, um, and that was really uh, having an impact in what you just approached as well, which is of course now getting into the next stage. This is not over, of course, but uh, it's the whole issue about the economic aspects of, uh, uh, of this pandemic. Um, here you can see on the map um, the size of the circles has to do with the number of cases. And as I've mentioned, there is some heterogeneity in the, across Europe with the, the main countries affected, Italy, Spain, France, Germany. Interestingly, they have a high number of cases, but they have actually a low number uh, um, a low fatality rate um, compared with uh, uh, with some uh, some other countries, and then of course the UK, and you can see here Sweden with uh, with a large number of cases and also the fatality rate, which is uh, uh, very high. Just uh, just gives you as today the numbers for you for the EU uh, and UK. We still include UK in the, in the EU. So we have over uh, one million and close to three hundred thousand cases. And we have about 150,000 uh, deaths. And again, this is for the 27 plus uh, the UK. And you can see there the breakdown of uh, the different countries again. Uh, in terms of uh, casualties, UK is now the number one with uh, over 30,000, 32,000 close to 33,000 uh, uh, deaths. Then Italy, France, Spain, Belgium, a very high rate also, a very high rate of uh, infection and also fatality rate uh, compared with uh, with some other countries. Now, uh, at the ESC, at the European Society of Cardiology, we've been very uh, much looking into uh, into this issue from the beginning. And uh, on the website, and I'm just showing you here the, uh, the website of the ESC, uh, there is a, a, a section which is dedicated uh, to COVID-19 and cardiology. As you know, and uh, Vivek just showed that uh, cardiovascular disease represents a very strong component in the uh, in this process. Not only because patients with cardiovascular disease they can be more affected and they can actually be more easily infected by the disease, but also when they are infected, they also develop a higher rate of complications, and the outcome is worse in patients who already have cardiovascular disease. So there was a lot of concern about this, uh, these patients and about this situation. So ESC dedicated a whole section to this uh, uh, to this condition, and there's a lot of information. If you uh, if you um, you may have been there already, but uh, if you if you go to the website, it's open. It's open access, uh, so you have a lot of information there. And there was a document that was produced uh, and basically provides guidance for the diagnosis and for the management, uh, particularly focusing on cardiovascular disease during this pandemic. And it's very helpful because it's not only about how to treat cardiovascular disease in patients with COVID, but also uh, it provides a lot of information on how to organize the Department of Cardiology in the setting of uh, uh, this pandemic. What started, I will show you just a little bit of that, and uh, how to uh, prioritize the type of procedures, uh, the type of uh, patients. So it's a very important, I think, document because it does provide a lot of information that can be very useful for us as uh, cardiologists, particularly when we have to organize and we had to reorganize basically the whole hospital and the, uh, in our case, the department to face the, the, uh, the pandemic. And uh, in this document, there's a lot of information that can be useful to organize this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, changes. Well, you've seen already, Vivek showed, just to remind that how the heart is involved in this disease. Basically, it can be involved in different ways. We know today, of, we know also there's a lot of things we don't know yet, but we know that uh, the virus can uh, um, not only cause a direct myocardial injury, and we know that when that happens, actually, as I will show you, the uh, prognosis uh, is more grim, is, uh, is worse, but it can also have other kinds of involvement. Just the fact that uh, in the cases of severe pulmonary disease, there is also an overload to the heart, and that's why patients with a heart condition, if they get 
pulmonary pneumonia or a infection or overload or ARDS like, uh, they decompensate and is actually one of the reasons of decompensation is uh, the involvement uh, of the lung. At the same time, uh, it can uh, originate fulminant myocarditis or some sort of myocarditis. And, uh, and also, it has been described the location of the virus on endothelial cells producing some sort of endothelitis. And that can actually be one of the reasons why these patients may develop some sort of thrombosis. We know that in some cases they can even develop uh, uh, intravascular disseminated uh, coagulation. And uh, it's also been shown that one of the reasons for decompensation is actually in some patients, they develop severe forms of uh, atriolitis with development of thrombi, and that can actually be responsible for some of the decompensation and actually for the more severe cases uh, that are affected in the lungs and then, of course, affecting uh, cardiac function. Now, this just gives you a little bit of an idea of some of the algorithms that have been uh, produced by the ESC trying to help on how to face the whole situation. Here we have how to do the triage in patients who are admitted to the emergency room. If they, are, if they have a, suspect, a suspicion of acute cardiovascular uh, syndrome or acute cardiovascular disorder. And again, basically the, the main concept, I will not go into all the details, but the main concept is to have uh, uh, separate circuits for the patients who have COVID or are suspicious of COVID and the other patients because one of the things that we have witnessed, and this has happened around the world, is the fact that, uh, of course, people are afraid to come to the hospital so there was a decline in the number of admissions in the emergency uh, room and that we want to ensure that to our population that it's safe to come to the hospital. We have separate circuits and, and the patients can come and, uh, and they should come if they have an acute event. Here we have for uh, patients with the suspicion of cardiogenic shock and possible COVID-19 infection. This uh, uh, in patients with uh, uh, hypotensive, with large MIs or acutely compensated heart failure. Uh, and here, basically, uh, one important aspect is, the, is to for have the healthcare providers for us always use the PPEs because that's very important. As you know, there were a lot of colleagues and a lot of health professionals that have been infected. And again, it's very important the protection of the health uh, uh, care uh, personnel to ensure that uh, we uh, we impair the number of potentially infected uh, uh, people. So if the shock, if the patient is in cardiogenic shock, then it should be treated as being infected. So all the preparation should be done in that direction. If the patient is not in shock, then there should be a confirmation of it uh, diagnosis first. Now, one important element, as I've mentioned, is the fact that there is a close correlation between the degree of myocardial injury and if it, that is assessed by troponin, and here we have uh, the temporal changes in high sensitivity uh, uh, cardiac troponin uh, concentrations from uh, uh, the illness onset of patients who have been hospitalized with COVID-19, and we see that uh, uh, the patients who had more severe forms of uh, uh, myocardial disease, and this is another study, so patients uh, who had elevated the troponin, these patients with or without cardiovascular disease, if they develop elevated troponin, they have worse prognosis than the patients with uh, uh, not elevated with normal troponin. So as a sign of myocardial injury, the presence of myocardial injury is a sign of bad prognosis in these patients. Now, another important element that uh, has been recommended is, um, of course, with this uh, uh, pandemic, there's been a change in the way that uh, we use the different uh, uh, diagnostic uh, elements, tests that we normally use. So uh, in this case, uh, there is a recommendation on the use of the non-invasive cardiovascular stress testing. And uh, basically, the indications, they have been much more, uh, uh, made much, much less because of, for, for instance, in terms of treadmill testing and so on, uh, there has been uh, indication that, for instance, stress tests in the treadmill uh, for routine should not be used because there's uh, the danger to, do, to create aerosols and to uh, disseminate the infection. And here you have basically... Uh, recommendations based on the regional involvement in the epidemic. So basically, if there is a severe 
involvement uh, of the region in terms of uh, the epidemic. Basically, there is inability to provide a normal health care and this should be focused and rearrange the whole health system. And that's how it has been done uh, across Europe and I guess across the world, but across Europe, we've been organized in this way to face uh, this uh, this pandemic and here again not get into the details but basically in this document you have the uh, uh, a, a strategical categorization in this case of invasive cardiac procedures where you have emergency procedures and those should be done even in the setting of the pandemic and then you have what uh, have been uh, classified as urgent like non stemi lower priority like patients with stable disease or elective procedures. So all elective procedures have been postponed and the, the patients with low priority, they also have been postponed and the, uh, it should be performed within the next three months or so. And if it's urgent, performed within days. So meaning basically that the whole way that we are normally organized in our cath labs, in our um, uh, the imaging departments has been changed and these were basically the rules that helped us to shape our activity and basically we developed protocols based on these indications uh, in terms of what so, what kind of uh, uh, procedures were done, what kind of patients were prioritized, what kind of uh, basically reorganization of the department uh, um, has to be done again here for arrhythmic heart disease, uh, heart failure, and uh, other in interventions. Of course, all the emergent interventions, those have been kept uh, as, uh, as, uh, as normal, of course. Here is re some recommendations for non-STEMI. And again, um, for STEMI, of course, the recommendation is for primary PCI. But for non-STEMI, the recommendation is only for the very high-risk patients to get into an invasive uh, um, strategy, as we normally do. For the other ones, they use a more conservative approach, again, according with the risk and the uh, condition uh, of the patient. And here for the STEMI, uh, again, clearly there was a, a clear pathway that was defined, but these patients were treated uh, as uh, with primary PCI, particularly in the, in the hospitals that have the ability to do 24-7 uh, primary PCI. Because of, uh, uh, particularly in some countries, of the overwhelm, uh, uh, engagement of the hospital and of the ICUs uh, in some hospitals. Fortunately, we did not face that, although we were ready for that in my hospital. We did not face as yes, some hospitals in Spain or in Italy had to face and, uh, and uh, they had to define criteria for admission to the ICU or for the ICU treatment and even for ventilation, uh, which uh, mechanical ventilation, which again uh, uh, this was important because in some places it uh, was a total overwhelm in terms of the number of patients that uh, came to the hospital and potentially uh, to have this. Uh, uh, and he, the recommendations for the patients with the uh, uh, observed cardiac arrest. Uh, and the uh, patients uh, on cardiogenic shock. Uh, and again, here also some recommendations for the negative patients or for the patients with suspected or positive uh, 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 virus. And um, now for the management of chronic coronary syndromes, again, uh, the indications during this period is for a more conservative approach and only revascularize the, the high-risk patients uh, uh, in case they are very symptomatic or if they develop some sort of uh, uh, um, complication. But otherwise, uh, it is uh, recommended that uh, in patients with chronic coronary syndromes, the strategy at this moment should be conservative, optimal medical therapy, and to be uh, conservative and only in only very specific cases to, uh, to have an invasive procedure. Let me just share with you to finalize some data coming from uh, from Europe. Uh, this comes from northern Italy, as you know, uh, Italy, as you know, in the uh, Lombardia, there was one of the most heat area in Europe. Uh, this is from the um, uh, Marco Metra's uh, group in Brescia, and uh, what it showed here was that uh, there was, uh, if you look at the clinical features of the patients uh, uh, that and this was a group of patients that uh, uh, with uh, uh, with COVID. You can see that uh, particularly uh, age, 
um, the presence of uh, uh, diabetes, of uh, heart failure, and uh, uh, patients uh, uh, who had uh, high SOFA scores, all these patients, they were at the high risk of uh, uh, developing complications. And here you can see, <coughs> excuse me, you can see that the patients who died, again, they had a very high, uh, compared with the patients uh, that survived, a very high levels uh, of pro-BNP, demonstrating that they were more, of course, decompensated. And again, uh, this shows that the patients who had previous cardiac disease, they had the worst outcome, so they had a higher mortality rate compared with the patients uh, who were admitted uh, in the hospital uh, but had no previous uh, history of cardiovascular disease. So basically uh, corroborated some of the previous data that we had from our Chinese colleagues. And here you can see, so uh, you have here the patients with uh, uh, cardiac disease. They had a significantly higher mortality rate compared with the patients uh, uh, with no cardiac disease. Um, again, almost double the mortality rate uh, in, the, in this group of uh, Italian patients. Just a word on that, because there was a lot of uh, controversy in terms of the use of uh, uh, ACE inhibitors uh, or, uh, um, uh, uh, blocker or uh, RAS blockers and the risk of COVID. This is a study that was just published a few days ago. And basically, it's a large population-based study. And basically, it showed, as was more or less our impression, that the use of these agents is more frequent among patients with COVID because more patients uh, with cardiovascular disease develop uh, uh, COVID, but there was no evidence that uh, there was an increased risk in these patients. And actually, there are even some anecdotal cases and a few reports that show that may, there may even be benefit instead of uh, increased risk. But this is one of the areas, there was another study that was published recently also that showed basically the same. So the use of ACE inhibitor, basically RAS blockers, branding angiotensin aldosterone system blockers, does not increase the risk uh, of uh, complications in patients with COVID-19. And this, uh, this is from my country, was published by a group here from my university. And it shows something which is one of the concerns we have now, is that uh, the excess mortality due not only to the COVID, but particularly due to the other uh, conditions, particularly by the fact that the patients don't come to the hospital and the impact that this may have in terms of some of the chronic diseases or even some acute diseases that the patients uh, may try to avoid to come to the hospital and therefore they develop more severe complications. And basically they show, this is in black, is the mortality by COVID. Uh, this is the uh, observation during about one month in, uh, uh, in Portugal, and there was a significant excess in mortality estimation, uh, and this, again, probably due to the fact that, again, uh, many of the other conditions are not being properly managed, and one of the reasons is the fact that patients are afraid to come to the emergency department or even to come uh, uh, to the hospital. And this shows, this black line shows the decrease uh, from the beginning. We had our first case here in Portugal in the 2nd of March, and this is uh, the number of admissions in the emergency department. So you can see a sharp decline in the number of patients coming to the emergency department. Now we're speaking up again. For instance, um, in the first uh, weeks, we had a decline of over 50% in terms of uh, uh, primary PCI. And, uh, um, and we had basically um, the ones who would come, patients with acute MI, they would come late. We saw ruptures, cardiac ruptures, which is very unusual for us now to see in the era of primary PCI. And we also had some patients that came very late with more severe forms of uh, um, heart failure due to um, acute myocardial infarction. We had a few patients that had to go on ECMO and some patients uh, uh, that will have to, the ones who survive that most likely will go into heart transplantation because they came too late uh, in the process. So I would summarize this part of uh, uh, um, our, our meeting by saying that cardiovascular disease, as you know, is a major complication and cause of death in patients with COVID-19. Patients who have cardiovascular disease, they have also, they have a high risk, they have a high likelihood of being infected. And the presence of myocardial injury is a marker of uh, poor outcome in these patients. Then, then 
cardiovascular departments, they have to adapt, they, we had to adapt during this COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, at the same time, this pandemic has been responsible not only for direct mortality due to the patients that died of COVID-19, but also indirect mortality and mobility. And this, uh, I'm sh we're still in the middle of the process. This needs to be further assessed. It just came uh, yesterday a, a, a paper from the UK, from Amit Banerjee, uh, um, uh, on the um, impact that this may have in the future, kind of a model to estimate the excess of mortality that we will be facing in the next few months. And certainly this pandemic affects uh, everybody and uh, um, it's uh, it's certainly uh, in our field in cardiovascular field uh, it's been one that has been very much affected and very much involved in the management of these patients so i will probably stop here now and uh, then be happy to have um, any questions and participate in the discussion and i will stop now my sharing thank you for your attention uh Thank you very much for your very nice presentation, Dr. Pinto, uh, one of the very leading cardiologists from Europe and Portugal. Um, we have, uh, I just welcome Madhuri Agarwal. She's joined uh, us and Dr. P.P. Monan is there. Uh, Madhuri Agarwal is a BJP leader from Kolkata. But uh, I have been told that Honorable Minister has to has another meeting. He will join him later on. So I'm requesting Dr. Fayaz Shaw uh, that uh, if, I, if he allows me that I would request Honorable Minister to do some uh, social message and then he will be listening but he will be out of the video but he will be listening to our talks but the, the video will not be with him but he will listen to all the talks of dr fashion and all so i would request the honorable minister to please come and join and give the social message uh, on the screen and i want to introduce our, my friend dr satin agrawal is from bareilly he was saying hello to you he's uh, in bareilly an orthopedic surgeon and actively involved in bjp and madhvi agrawal is also listening thank you very much for sir for coming and joining us and giving the moral boosting you can tell what Modi government is uh, actually uh, is doing and uh, the, the two crore, two lakh crore package which has been recently announced and I, we are listening to you now. You are unmuted. Thank you, sir. Sir, you say? Honorable Minister, sir. Yes, you say? I am requesting you to speak now. We are listening to you. And uh, all the economies are so uh, tough now. And the 
once again before he leave but he will be i will request you to please keep listening your video may not be on because dr fayaz shaw is a very eminent cardiologist from washington dc he will be now speaking but before he leaves i would like to introduce him again he is the chairman of uh, your republican party of india but he has a meeting just now and he has just pushed off his video but he is very important and close to honorable prime minister narendra modi ji so now i am requesting uh, so i was just saying that i was introducing you further to our european and american friend that you are very close to honorable minister prime minister and you are the minister for social and justice empowerment of government of india and you are taking care of so many people as of now is in bombay uh, he is based out of bombay but he is in but his office in delhi thank you very much sir thank you so may i invite uh, dr fayaz shaw uh, he is not a name who would not every cardiologist in india or the whole world knows him and he is indian origin american cardiologist if i am not wrong in saying that but uh, he has done lot of research very aggressive cardiologist and uh, especially high complex cases he has been doing and we all know him we all learn from him he is in washington adventist hospital in washington dc and i am thankful to him for joining us and he said he has to leave at 11 am their time but now i would request him to start his presentation and also if he wants he can introduce himself once again sorry uh we are trying to unmute you but uh, 
Okay. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry, sorry for delay of 15 seconds. Uh, thank you, Vivek, for a wonderful meeting, and I thank you for your kind invitation. I know this is a very serious issue. We're all involved. We're all in together. So I'm going to focus myself on uh, cardiovascular involvement in COVID-19. I don't want to repeat what you said eloquently, and uh, Dr. Pinto gave us a wonderful presentation. So um, let me go and share my slides with you. Uh, okay. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, yes, very good, very nice. We can see okay. well. So uh, I don't want to repeat, as we know that uh, it uh, coronavirus has. Uh, you know, reach a pandemic level, and uh, uh, we know the uh, cardiovascular issues with uh, coronavirus. But let me focus on uh, what we know today about COVID 19 and cardiovascular issue. Um, as of last night, um, uh, in the United States, here we had about 1.3 million people with almost 82,000 deaths. Uh, of those uh, 82,000 deaths, about one third uh, uh, occurred in New York. Uh, uh, I live in Maryland and DC and Virginia district. Uh, we had here 64,000 cases so far with 2,900 deaths. But you know, this is a global problem. More than 4 million people have died worldwide. And uh, while efforts to contain COVID-19 outbreak continues, but some states, uh, especially in the United States and some states in Europe, have shifted uh, their focus towards reopening uh, their economies. But let me tell you, I'm very worried. I think we may, uh, we're not ready yet to open the economies and that may give us grave consequences if, they op if we open too quickly, as we still have cases every day. Now, um, as we know that COVID-19 causes predominantly viral pneumonia with additional extra pulmonary manifestations and large proportion of patients, which we see here and around the globe have underlying cardiovascular or they have cardiac risk factors. Now the risk factors uh, have been shown to uh, be associated with high mortality, especially male sex, advanced age, presence of comorbidities, particularly hypertension, diabetes, and cerebrovascular disease. As Dr. Uh, uh, Pinto mentioned earlier, that uh, we see cardiac injury, which is determined by elevated high sensitive troponin level, is strongly associated with high mortality. Dr. Shaw, Dr. Flash, Shaw, we are seeing your slide, only one slide, it's not moving. It's not moving? Yeah, it's not moving. We are seeing only the first slide which shows CCBR. Oh, let me let me uh, let me do something here. This should be exit. I'm sorry about that. Is there someone you share the slides and then you have them the the mouse marker onto the slides and then it will move. Yes, it's better. Yeah, yeah. So we were seeing only first slide for Dr. Sorry, I'm going to. Uh, can you see now it's moving? Yeah, it's moving now. It's moving now. Okay. All right. So I'm going to uh, talk about here that uh, with high mortality, you can see it was a recent publication from the United States over 4,000 patients with COVID 19 showing in US the highest mortality was in patients with about the age of 85. 10 to 27% mortality. Uh, between 84 and 65, 3 to 11%. From age 55 to 64, 1 to 3%. And less mortality between the age of 20 to 54. And there was no fatality in the US among 19 or below. So it's really 
the much elder pop, elderly population who have high mortality. But there, there has been some recent reports from New York, few deaths among young kids, what we call pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome, uh, PIMS, whether it's related to Kawasaki disease or separate COVID-19 remains to be seen. Pretty disturbing that uh, we thought that it's not affecting the young children, but we're seeing something new with COVID-19. And also um, a few publications from on JAMA and Lancet uh, from China suggested that COVID-19 can trigger acute coronary syndrome, Arrhythmia in heart block, excess pressure or heart failure. This may be due to combination of severe systemic inflammation plus localized vascular inflammation of the endothelium at the arterial level. Um, um, I want to also mention that um, when we have elevated troponin, it occurs in 10 to 30 percent of all hospitalized patients. The normal coronaries, 10 to 30 percent. And when it's in ICU, 22 percent have elevated troponin level. So they are really, when they come, uh, there are two types of cardiac injury. One is predominantly respiratory presentation, ARDS, abnormal chest x ray, abnormal CT. But you, in this population, there's a progressive increase of troponin alongside of the biomarkers of systemic inflammation. As the biomarkers go up because of cytokine um, storm, there is more increase of troponin. Or it could be a predominantly cardiac presentation. Then you have EKG changes, uh, which I will show in a minute, could be due to myocarditis, or stress cardiomyopathy, or Takasobo, or true ACS. It just shows you here, uh, this is from uh, Roxanne Maran slide, uh, she recently presented that when we have um, COVID-19 and they have this uh, cytokine um, storm, there's also increase in D-dimer, reduction of the lymphocyte count, uh, increase in the ferritin level, and also uh, interleukin-6, you know. And you can see as the disease gets more worse, as uh, Dr. Pinto showed, there's much higher in the troponin. Higher the troponin, higher the mortality. Is it, this is an example of a patient was just published in JAMA showing diffuse ST elevation in a patient with COVID-19 and normal coronaries. And the uh, cardiac MRI showed hyperintensity suggesting intracellular edema with low uh, ejection fraction. So having said that, what is the current guidelines for uh, how to manage ACS patient in COVID era? This is the uh, from the American College of Cardiology, ACCAHA. Um, you have to really look to is the high risk ACS or low risk or risk ACS. If it's a high risk ACS, of course, a guideline directed medical management, and we'll do urgent or emergent angiography intervention. As I will talk in a minute, that in order to do that, you need a, a dedicated cath lab. Um, like here, we have seven cath labs. One is dedicated to COVID positive or COVID possible. Because uh, if you do testing, it takes time. And if somebody is unstable from a cardiac standpoint, we take them to the dedicated cath lab, which is a negative pressure room with complete PPE. So that is when we do these cases uh, in a dedicated cath lab. Now, if a patient is uh, a low risk case with ACS, we do only angiography and intervention if the recurrent symptoms or decompensation. Similarly, in STEMI, if it's a STEMI patient, we really, and uh, uh, it's through STEMI, we still go directly to the cath lab. Uh, whether they are COVID or no COVID, but again, it has to be a dedicated cath lab. And believe me, there is no role of thrombolytics in this uh, robust care system uh, unless you don't have it. Um, then I think you can get thrombolysis. But I'll talk in a minute if you have thrombolysis. Uh, there will be many patients you're making thrombolysis with normal coronaries. 
because uh, also, uh, you know, as Dr. Pinto showed, we don't see much STEMIs. Uh, where have they gone? In fact, this is the recent data showing 38% reduction in STEMIs in our area, in Washington, D.C. area. 38% reduction in STEMI in patients. This has been also shown in Italy, Spain, UK, Canada. There is marked reduction in the number of STEMIs coming now, even patients with ACS and non-STEMI. We don't see many of these patients. Now, where they have gone and why they don't see it? Well, it could be due to there's less pollution, less cars, less stressful situation. Patients are home. They have no jobs. There is lockdown. They are relaxed. There's less physical activity at home, more sleep, more time with the family, less stress. They are taking more medication. They're more compliant. Uh, but but I can tell you that there have been some reports that patients are also afraid to come to the hospital. And there has been a, an increase in the number of cardiac arrests at home. In fact, there was a paper just a couple of days ago from New York. There was an 800% increase in cardiac deaths at home because patients are afraid to come. In fact, uh, in the last couple of days, we have been seeing more coming STEMIs as we saw, say, two and a half months ago. In fact, uh, there's a North American COVID registry coming up, NACMI, in data in com coming weeks to show you how uh, we have uh, reduced the number of cases uh, during this COVID era. Plus, you know, we don't do any elective cases, no elective towers. Uh, we only do urgent cases, which has been going on for the last two to three months. But we know when there is COVID, there's a direct myocardial uh, infection by inflammation, myocarditis, endothelial dysfunction, and also atherosclerosis acceleration and activation and a plaque rupture and endothelial dysfunction, and also increased prothrombogenicity, uh, causing both type one, type two ACS, uh, thromboembolic phenomena, Strokes in young people. We had a patient a couple of days ago with a massive stroke, a 34 year old patient, the massive stroke from middle cerebral artery. And was, there's also an element of DIC. This is an EKG of a patient a couple of days ago who comes with diffuse ST elevation with some right bundle. But he had family history, family had COVID, he had all the symptoms of COVID. And he had a cardiac catheterization. He had normal coronaries. But unfortunately, uh, he uh, did not make it despite ECMO. He was very sick. You can see the repeat EKG showing same changes. Uh, this was a, a, a series of cases from New York showing ST segment elevation in COVID patients. What was fascinating that when you have normal coronaries, uh, 40% had diffused ST elevation. When you have true myocardial infarction, there's focal ST elevation, either as inferior, anterior, or lateral, while, while in uh, patients who have normal coronaries and STEMI, 40% had diffused ST elevation, 60% had focal ST elevation. But the key thing was uh, doing echo on these patients a segment of wall motion abnormalities, which were done in nine on echoes, did not have wall motion abnormality. While as patient with true MI, 75% had true wall motion abnormality. Also, when you have a true STEMI, you have a much higher troponin level than, uh, than patients who have a STEMI but normal coronaries, but the mortality is high. You can see patients with true STEMI, with coronary disease and COVID, 50% mortality. But if you have normal coronaries, 90% mortality in patients with COVID when they don't have um, coronary disease. You can see here, uh, these 18 patients, uh, majority died. And you can see the timing of the EKG changes. Some people have EKG changes when they come in, or some people have EKG ST elevations later, as late as six to seven days. So EKG may not be abnormal at the time of admission, but you can see ST elevation COVID patients 
the normal cardio race had a later part, anywhere from four days to 12 days, or in this particular case, at 11 days, uh, there was an EKG changes. And uh, one of the patients uh, uh, who had uh, uh, EKG changes in the beginning had heavy thrombus burden, and uh, one patient had, again, a big thrombotic occlusion, got lightings, but he died 24 hours later. So in other words, is, uh, when you have a non-STEMI patient, uh, they have conventional risk factors, and majority have non-obstructive coronary disease in COVID era. The potential mechanism of myocardial injury, I'm talking elevated uh, troponin, is acute infection, triggering an intense myocardial demand, or an cytokine storm caused by severe inflammatory stress precipitating plaque rupture and its ability uh, the timing of angiography as i said we don't do angiograms the non stemi unless they're unstable as we know that majority will have uh, normal coronaries now when it comes to stemi um, majority as i just showed you have non obstructive cad but they have lv dysfunction but they don't have segmental wall motion memory. they have more global LV dysfunction due to COVID-19 myocarditis or stress cardiomyopathy or tachycephalus. Now, um, what is the impact of COVID-19 here in the U.S. on acute MI? I think it, it is continuing to rise here as is worldwide. It has got enormous impact on healthcare system. As I said earlier, we have canceled all elective procedures we converted outpatient visits to telemedicine and limited visitors to, uh, to come to the hospital. In fact, uh, anybody who comes to the hospital, a COVID or no COVID, there's no visitation, there's no family in the hospital. Um, uh, I think uh, there's no question the management of true STEM is challenging because of the risk of exposing the personnel and patient to the infection versus the benefit of primary PCI. And I am not personally in favor of thrombolytics uh, because the reason here we have a dedicated cath lab for STEMIs or patients who are acutely sick. Because if you give thrombolytics, you know, uh, there's a risk of because these patients have a history of stroke, they can hemorrhage stroke. And also we know with COVID, there's multi organ failure and cytokine storm, and there'll be more bleeding issues. And also, um, as I mentioned, that one third of patients with COVID-19 will go to ARDS, and that therefore there'll be increased risk of alveolar hemorrhage in the lung using thrombolytics. And also, um, the ST elevation does not mean they have a true STEMI. So ST elevation can be because of Takasobo, myopericarditis, spontaneous coronary dissection. I think, therefore, um, we don't uh, propose a thrombolytics uh, in patients with STEMI or when EKG changes looks like the STEMI. Because also we know if you have a true MI and you get thrombolytics, which may increase the, increase the hospital resources. With thrombolytics, it works in 55% to 60%, 70% of reinfarction rate, uh, and a very high mortality. So I'd like to conclude uh, that uh, management of STEMI is challenging in, in this pandemic area. While thrombolytics could, could be a good choice, but in many patients be contraindicated. Also, the, uh, uh, if you do an angiogram, there's a high probability that these people have normal coronaries. Um, uh, Non-invasive testing with careful uh, um, use of uh, Personal protection may differentiate true STEMI from because if you're true STEMI, they will have segmental wall motion abnormalities on echo. And also, the uh, uh, if they go to cath lab, as I said again, the personal protection equipment is very crucial. As you know, in European data, there have a lot of cardiologists who have died. So I think it is very important that if you want to take the cath lab, that there is personal protective equipment as Dr. Gupta showed when he did this case this morning. That's why we have a dedicated cath lab for COVID-19. 
So uh, uh, I like to conclude that COVID-19 is associated with high inflammatory burden that can induce vascular inflammation, myocarditis, cardiac arrhythmias, and death. Uh, effective um, treatment is really uh, vaccines, which we don't have. And we don't have yet any good antiviral agents against this virus. Um, just quickly, uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, has been shown it is not effective. In fact, the FDA has issued a warning of serious uh, complications, especially with people with underlying heart disease to do hydrochloroquine or chloroquine. Although uh, one of the, uh, uh, there is going a prospective study by Novartis on a large scale. Uh, until we know more clinical data, we don't give uh, hydrochloroquine here in the United States. Um, as uh, Dr. Uh, Gupta mentioned that uh, uh, this drug uh, uh, Remdesivir uh, has really um, shown that the time to recovery is reduced from 11 days to 15 days, 31% reduction in the uh, uh, recovery. And although the mortality rate was not different, there was a tendency towards lower mortality rate with Remdesivir, 8% versus 11%. Uh, but larger studies are done. But as I said earlier, that uh, in some patients who have serious cytokine storm with the release of uh, all these uh, tumor necrosis factors, uh, we have been using this uh, inhibitor toxilamide B, uh, is a drug given for rheumatoid arthritis. And um, finally, I'd like to share that I know that presently we have to do social distancing, wearing of mask, as Dr. Gupta mentioned. But the most importantly, you can see you can't touch these because you can get contamination from copper, cardboard, stainless steel, and plastic. Look at here, the half-life of virus with the, with the cardboard is almost four hours. Stainless steel, six hours. Plastic, seven hours. So it may be there for many hours. So it's very important that you don't touch these items, especially plastic. There could be a virus. So you have to be very careful besides social distancing, which is presently what we are doing here in the world, in the United States, wearing masks, but also cleaning these items and not to touch them. In, including your cell phone, which you should use an alcohol swab because you can carry a virus, get infected. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for a very enlightening talk, uh, especially the COVID-19 acute coronary syndrome, involvement of heart and everything. And uh, so we will have a panel comments because we have a lot of questions. Uh, and then I first, Paul Sharma from Chandigarh PGI Health Department has just joined. Dr. Mansoor Ahmed from Pakistan has joined. He was already there. Madam Madhvi Agarwal and Mr. Vineet Chaudhary, who is our friend, and he will sing some songs later on. I would like to inform you that uh, this is going uh, part of collaboration with Talk Nexus, which has a 3.8 lakh doctors, and it will be again. Uh, it will be a sort of a repeat telecast or sort of something like that on that website for at least another week or so. So we have a very important being recorded on and also Facebook Live by Indians in Paris, which is 25,000 people. So I want I was told that uh, some that Madhvi Agarwal would like to speak because she is because she's a media panelist. Then we'll take questions. Uh, she has a media panelist and she has to go to on the news uh, now in 8:30 p.m. So you are just invited to say something uh, briefly about uh, the social message from Kolkata, active DJP worker and a friend of many in uh, in the government. Madhuji, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Gupta. Uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to say that it is important for all is to be positive during this lockdown. The pandemic was really unexpected the, and uh, although it is a tough time for all, but being positive is only key. The entire world is fighting uh, through this tough time and nobody expected 
that the world may go uh, go through through a, a recession that to this huge in this situation it is really important for all of us to be tough and fight through all the difficulties for a better tomorrow uh because i am uh, associate with bjp so i just want to say that uh, pm modi ji has taken uh, appropriate steps to fight the situation by imposing lockdown and keeping people confined uh, this has not only helped us to uh, contain the virus but the entire world has been appreciating our efforts we really need to be a part of this battle and give outmost support to the decisions that that are made by the government so abhi uh, jis tarike se uh, log jo hai kyunki lockdown ka samay itna zyada bar bar lockdown uh, repeat ho raha hai to logo mein ek uh, jo hai wo uh, depression na aa jaye iske liye zaruri hai ki apne aap ko regularly motivate karte rahe log और उसके लिए एक मुझे लगता है कि इसके लिए भी हम लोगों को कुछ करना चाहिए लोगों को मोटिवेट करने के लिए भी ऑनलाइन अगर हम लोग कुछ इस तरीके के प्रोग्राम्स चलाएं जो कि उनको अवेयर करें तो ये बहुत जरूरी है तो बस मैं इतना कहना चाहूंगी क्योंकि आप बहुत अच्छा काम कर रहे हैं और इसी तरीके से आप लोगों को जो है कोरोना वायरस के लिए जो एक जानकारी है सही जानकारी सब डॉक्टर पैनल के साथ में मिलकर आप दे रहे हैं ये बहुत एक सोशल एक अच्छा मैसेज जा रहा है लोगों के पास तो मेरी बहुत बहुत शुभकामना आप सभी लोगों को और uh, मैं बस इतना ही कहूंगी कि आई होप दैट सिचुएशन इज ओवर सुन एंड थिंक गो बैक टू नॉर्मल एंड थैंक यू सो मच डॉक्टर गुप्ता फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी ऑन दिस ऑनलाइन डिस्कशन इट वाज रियली ग्रेट अपॉर्चुनिटी फॉर टू स्पीक इन फ्रंट ऑफ एवरी थैंक यू सो मच Thank you, Madhavi ji, for your nice and lightning talk. And you have to go on the TV news, and we always appreciate the efforts of the social people to help us. So now I would uh, go on to the uh, panel discussion. But I think Dr. Mona will start because he was supposed to speak something. But I think the questions are ready uh, with everybody now with the two stalwarts, uh, Dr. Faiz Shaw and Dr. Pinto there. So we can have. Uh, I don't think anybody else else has to share the slides. So now I request Dr. Mona to please come in and join. and tell us and start the panel comments and discussion on what dr pinto and dr fayaz shon has already spoken about and we have lot of queries regarding heart regarding covid otherwise cardiological society of india he is the president elect of cardiological society of india and he is working in trichur in kerala and we have also dr kalmat joined just now from bombay so i just welcome him again and he will be speaking about the comments and give some questions to the Or the the authorities who are there live with us. Please Thank come. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for the kind invitation for the second time. I'm a part of your program and uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Pinto. Pin Professor Pinto, incidentally, is the president-elect of the World Heart Federation. Also, he was the past president of the European Society of Cardiology. Yes, uh, as uh, are you, and uh, of course, the, both the international expert has. Uh, Dealt in detail about the cardiac aspects of COVID. I will just touch, uh, take a minute, and touch on the. Now you also titled today's session as the impact on the healthcare. So I will just be mentioning about that. Uh, uh, Professor Pinto, uh, uh, to your, just like the ESC did the guidance to your members, the Cardiological Society of India also has uh, come out. Came out with some position statements uh, to help its members and otherwise with the how to tackle a stimmy situation in a in a COVID scenario and how to tackle again the importance of continuation of ACE inhibitors and ARB uh, was again uh, uh, correctly mentioned and sent communicate to all its members about the usefulness of uh, continuation and never ever stop those vital drugs. we also have a communicate regarding um, the uh, uh, how to do the imaging especially echocardiogram which is a very very uh, uh, private investigation in fact where the, the chances of spread is very high where the our uh, echo sub council has come out with a statement about uh, how one should be uh, taking care of these uh, these important investigation for the cardiologists so the the cardiological society 
please. Just a minute about the the impact, the adverse impact of COVID on uh, on the healthcare scenario, especially in India. And uh, Dr. Shal uh, mentioned about the disappearing MIs. All of us have seen the decreasing number of uh, cardiovascular events. No heart failure, no STEMIs. Uh, now, practically, the National Health Mission of India has come out with a figure uh, which is almost akin to the published that Faisal was mentioning about the nine hospital uh, report from Newark, which was published recently in Jan, uh, which said about 36 to 38 percent reduction uh, in the STEMIs. It's almost similar. We don't have a, a authentic data, but the data from the National Health Mission and otherwise shows that there was an appreciable reduction in acute cardiovascular care. And that is a big, big uh, 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 adversary factor for the private health care industry in India. For information, even though the COVIDs are being managed essentially by the public health uh, institutions. Of course, in many other areas, the private uh, uh, health care is taking an active uh, part. But uh, we know that at least 70, 70 to 75% of the patient health, health care in India is uh, forced by the, supported by the private health care. And the COVID, with his, uh, with his decreasing Foot footfalls on the outpatients and the decreasing uh, uh, the number of because of the compulsion, the lockout, and the the uh, the government also said that don't do any any elective procedure. So the private healthcare industry has suffered quite a lot, and also the same on the one end you have the decreasing revenue, and on the other end you have the increasing expenditure. You have to increase your, uh, now the, now the, for example, the, the usefulness of PPE. That's again a big toll on the on the healthcare industry. So one has to balance these, and I'm sure the Gupta was mentioning, and the minister also was mentioning about the the 20 lakh crore support. I sincerely wish that the private healthcare also gets its sufficient support from the government. Uh, 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 sure, uh, I mean, I think we can take up the questions now, Dr. Gupta. Your sound, your sound. Okay. So there are uh, two, three questions which have come from Doc Plexus, and then everybody is, who can speak and allow and uh, they can join. Uh, the one question is, are AS inhibitors being prescribed to COVID-19 patients in Europe and US? I think Dr. Pinto can answer this. Uh, second would be, what would be the reason behind the reduced number of STEMI case among the COVID-19 patients? What would be the reason? And secondly, in what way COVID-19 affected the future of cardiology practice? This is coming from Doc Plexus. And what are the guidelines for treating COVID-19 patients with severe hypertension in Europe? So I'll, re I'll request a Dr. Pinto to answer regarding those two questions, ACE inhibitors, and uh, uh, regarding the uh, number of STEMI patients going down and severe hypertension guidelines for treating COVID-19 patients with severe hypertension in Europe. Well, uh, we um, there was a very early recommendation from the ESC that the ACE inhibitors and ARBs should not be uh, interrupted in patients who were being treated with uh, with those medications, and uh, and that uh, fortunately we have data now to support that. And actually, there are even some reports that they may actually be, uh, in a way, positive in the sense that uh, by blocking uh, uh, the angiotensin uh, receptors, there were a couple of studies that showed that may even be beneficial. But at least they are not harmful. And that was very important because there was, I had a lot of patients asking because there was a lot of rumors. As you know, there's been a lot of fake news uh, around the, the whole COVID uh, issue. And, uh, and that's certainly something that we have to reassure our patients and we've been doing that. And um, the current recommendation is if the patient is on a NACE inhibitor or ARB, should not stop and we should not change the medication for that reason. And I, I'm prescribing, you know, as I used to do, um, if there is an indication for an ARB or an ACE inhibitor. So I don't think that's uh, going to be any change in the way that we are managing uh, hypertension um, regarding the use of ACE inhibitors and, uh, and ARBs. Uh, for the STEMIs, um, 
I mentioned that also, and the colleagues also, in terms of the reduction of uh, the number of patients coming, and that's a real issue. <coughs> Excuse me, because the, the, the problem now is actually, and I think the main reason is actually the patients who were afraid to come to the hospital with acute events. And one of the things that we are doing now in the different um, countries and the, here in Europe, uh, ESC, the national societies, are very much having movies and going into the media to make sure that the patients get reassurance to come to the hospital uh, so they can be treated timely. Because the other issue is not only uh, there was an increase in the number of people dying at home, but also the people who come, they come late. You know, as I've mentioned, we have patients coming with a week of uh, 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 evolution of an acute MI. And as we know, that's, that's going to mean left ventricle dysfunction, heart failure, and there's actually a, a few registries and a few studies now looking at the impact of uh, uh, these, all these uh, changes in terms of uh, um, how this is going to impact on the, um, uh, on, on the patient profile uh, in the future. My feeling is that we're going to have an increase of patients with heart failure because many of these patients with either non-STEMI or even with STEMI, they didn't come. So now they probably have significant left ventricle dysfunction and they will evolve into heart failure. So that's, uh, uh, that's my guess. So um, important now at this stage for all of us to reassure our patients that uh, it's important to come to the hospital, call the doctor, and if there is a, a, an, an event, we, we have here in Europe uh, what we call the green wave for acute coronary syndromes and also for stroke. So the patient can call the, 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 the this kind of a, a 911 kind of number that the patient calls and it's very fast and it works very well. But if the patient doesn't call, you know, <laughs> nothing is going to happen and, uh, and there's going to be a problem. So I think it's going to be one of the issues now is how we're going to convince the population to be trust to trust again to come uh, to the hospital and to be uh, so we can treat these patients at the stage that we used to do. What I used to say is for COVID at the moment we don't have treatment, but for the QTMI we do have treatment. So it's a shame that we are not treating a condition that we can now treat. While the other one is important, of course, but uh, uh, it should not shy away people from coming to the hospital uh, to treat the condition that we can treat. I totally agree with you because we are facing the same problem in Apollo Hospital Delhi. Now, the whole Delhi, the whole India knows that in the press, Apollo Hospital is COVID, COVID, COVID hospital. That means we have already a big number of patients. 81 beds are reserved, as I told you. And a lot of people, they don't want to come to this hospital because they feel that they will get infected. So as I told you that uh, we are using the PPE kit otherwise, but we have different isolation area, but you can't change the psychology of the patient. And I totally agree with you that there may be increased the heart failure patient because if the acute MI doesn't come, or they just to keep uh, treating themselves at home or to a clinical practice or somewhere. So it will be a difficult situation. Uh, my, I would now turn the mic towards Dr. Raghu, uh, Raghu from Bangalore. He is a president, president of Indian College of Cardiology, and he's actually head of department in Sri Jadeva Institute of uh, University, and in, is head of department in cardiology. So Dr. Raghu has kindly agreed, and please give some comments. And if you have some, uh, please go ahead. So. Oh, sorry, I have to unmute you. Uh, just give me a second. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Raghu, please go ahead. It's a good Dr. friend. Vick, Dr. Vick, thank you for the excellent program. I attended the first one also. This also, it's almost, uh, it gives clear ideas our practicing physicians and cardiologists. Probably, it is, it is, I think we have to live with COVID now. As a Prime Minister tell, probably pre-COVID era and it's going to be post-COVID era. And we should have dedicated hospitals like you have probably in every city. There should be a COVID hospital, probably all these related problems, whether acute myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, acute kidney injury, maybe patient who requires dialysis. Probably COVID patient can be treated separately. I think probably we should start the future, probably you should have dedicated COVID hospital in all the cities. That may serve the purpose because we have to live with COVID. Probably COVID will not go away. And practice is going to change. 
Uh, you're right, yeah, because uh, I was shocked to hear to see the news item where Boris Johnson says the Prime Minister of UK, who has been himself suffered from COVID and now recovered, he said that the vaccine may not at all come. So I would like to have the panel view that uh, is it possible that the, all the vaccine, the human trial which is going on, that is it a small possibility that uh, I thought there may not be at all vaccine? Dr. Pinto, what is your thought process? Well, the, uh, nobody knows, basically, but uh, there is a huge investment. As you know, there's a lot of different uh, companies, there's a consortia, there's a lot of investment now. There's a big, there was a big endowment just a, a few days ago for research in this area. So, you know, we, we're living probably the fastest time to, to try to find either a new medication or a new vaccine. Um, we have an example where we could not manage to have a vaccine in HIV. We don't have a vaccine. We do have good treatment, and uh, but we don't have a vaccine. But I think in this case, it will be very important to try to contain the infection because, um, and it's not going to be through herd immunity. And I know it's going to be different in different countries. But for instance, the strategy now in some countries is trying to, for test, using uh, uh, control testing, try to reduce the spread of the disease and try to contain it. And uh, um, in some countries that has been possible, but with a change in the way people behave. For instance, now you, you mentioned the masks. Now the masks are mandatory here in, uh, in my country for people going in public transportation, going into, into closed spaces, shops and uh, uh, shopping centers and that kind of uh, uh, areas. Um, and uh, the way, pe and of course, social distancing and um, washing hands, you know, all that uh, sort of recommendations. So basically, it's gonna, if you look at some parts of the world where they're practicing this kind of uh, attitudes, they've managed to have good results. Uh, but the problem is that we don't still know what's going to be the long-term effect. And again, it will depend on the characteristics of the country. New Zealand, for instance, now, they apparently uh, have such a low infection rate. They have an R, which is like 0 0.1 or something, that they probably are at the stage they, they, they got rid of uh, um, the virus, although it's never going to be 100%. In other countries, it's going to be much more difficult. Denmark said today that they got rid of the virus. I, you know, I don't think that's real. But if you have uh, an attitude in the country to try to promote um, in the way people live, social uh, distancing, use mandatory use of masks, I think we'll probably be able to go back to a, a new normal, as we say now. It's not going to be, until we have a vaccine or a, a, a specific treatment, it's not going to be as we used to have before these. But we also have to adapt. And as some of you have mentioned, you know, things will not be the same. And at least during this period, I think we have to try to help also the society to go back to some normalcy. And this has to do with the uh, imposition of some rules different from what used to be. And for instance, you know, countries like Northern countries, they are much easier to have social distancing. They are used to that. In the South of Europe, for instance, people are used to hug, to kiss, to, to touch. And that's a completely different uh, story now. People have now to just stay away from each other, to use uh, uh, masks and uh, some sort of barriers to try to mitigate the dissemination of the virus. But it, it, it's going to take time um, to, and, and again, the strategies may differ a little bit from country to country, from zone to zone, because in some places it might be more wise to use a certain strategy, uh, while in others it may be more difficult and you have to adapt also to the circumstances that you are facing uh, in your specific part of the world. Here we're trying now to, to uh, deal with the situation using all these rules, trying to mitigate, trying to reduce the spread of the virus. Uh, now we're going down in the number of cases, uh, the hospitals manage in our country to always be able to accommodate all the patients that uh, we uh, we had admit. There was no rupture in the system, but because we have very strong measures, and, and and the thing is, you know, how can you gradually? And we are 
they're trying now to gradually open. So now we're opening a little bit. We're monitoring, we're assessing, we're doing a lot of testing. I think that's a key thing. Because if you identify somebody, then you can isolate that person immediately. As you know, now you have ways to track, uh, even by using the mobile phone you mentioned that, Vivek, uh, that uh, uh, we have to do our best to try to identify people infected so we can isolate them, so we should mitigate uh, the number of uh, infected people. I don't believe in herd immunity, to be honest. I think actually can be catastrophic, particularly, in, and just see what's happening in the UK. Uh, even Sweden, you know, they, they, they have a fatality rate, which is like four or five times the one we have. Uh, and um, I don't think, um, you know, human life is uh, should be our primary goal. So, um, again, try, and that's what we are trying to advise also our politicians and our decision makers to uh, go in a way that uh, we go slowly, we go with uh, uh, not going uh, openly. Of course, everybody would like to open the society again, but that's not possible. And it's going to be up to us, the medical doctors and the scientists and the, the medical community, to try to help the decision makers to go slowly. Uh, you saw, I don't know if you saw, if you saw yesterday, uh, in the U.S., uh, the, there was an audition with the Fauci and uh, some other people, and they were very clear. You know, in the U.S. now is facing, particularly in some areas, very, very difficult situation. Maybe Dr. Shaw can want, want to comment on this. But uh, uh, we really have to be prudent. We really have to be careful. And uh, we have to impose or to help to impose some measures that can help to mitigate the disease and uh, in a way minimize the contamination, the dissemination of the infection. True. Uh, there are two questions more with Dr. Kal One question is for Dr. Kalmat himself. Uh, and there is a question from Dr. Kalmat to, uh, to everyone. A question to uh, from Dr. Kalmat, your BC Kalmat from UK, from Bombay. And he's asking to uh, Europeans, especially Dr. Fento can ask here, uh, what are the real qualities of PPE kits in Europe and USA as we in India, everybody is selling PPE kits. Dr. Kalmar, you can ask directly. You are unmuted. Yeah, uh, Vivek, very beautiful conference. And I mean, good uh, points. And because as you just showed me, you're doing a class T, the PPE sold in India are not the real PPEs. They're just the kits which are used for uh, like HIV kits or like that. Because the real quality of a PP should be enumerated because it's a huge risk to just to wear any PP and do a primary PCA where COVID results are not given up. So I would like to really comment on really the, what are the crucial steps in selecting the proper P, PP and then a little bit on donning and doffing. Can you answer this? What are the protocols in your place regarding when you're doing angioplasty, even if it's COVID-19 negative patient? So how how much risk is there? Because today negative can be a positive tomorrow. So uh, my Dr. Kalmut is a, a very important cardiologist from Bombay Hospital in Bombay. And he's very experienced. His question is, uh, how can we really monitor the quality of PPE uh, when you're doing suspicion and the healthcare workers are actually at, at huge risk? So what's your say as far as Europe is concerned? Well, here in Europe, we, uh, the, all the PPEs have to be certified. So um, all the all the PPEs we use, um, they they have to be certified by the national um, uh, agency. So um, well, we hope they, they they are okay. We had a little bit of a problem at the beginning. Was in the in the in the we had a little bit shortage, you know, at the beginning in some places of PPEs. Not the quality itself, but the, the number. And um, and there was a little bit of an issue, um, particularly in, in the first couple of weeks in some her in, in some areas, and we did have some people infected, uh, health professionals. Now it's okay. Now we have uh, more than enough, and uh, um, and basically, you know, they are certified. So we we hope they are uh, good. And, um, and and the fact that we don't have many people infected now from our health professionals. Um, it's uh, it's a sign that uh, they work at. Again, you 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 need to have proper training also, particularly if you really use the, the you know the, the full gowns and the um, the full PPEs. Uh, but uh, people go through kind of a training how to how to put them on, how to take them off, 
the risk is more on taking taking them off. You have to be very careful, as you know. Uh, so we go through education sessions for the for the, the the health professionals, not only the doctors but also the nurses and the, the assistants and so on. Um, and I think that's crucial. Uh, the way we treat our here our patients, and that was mentioned, it's the same. You know, any patient we don't know if uh, um, he or she, if you don't have the result, then we treat as if it was a positive. So uh, and uh, while we wait for, so if it's the same, we do the of course the procedure. We use full protection, uh, but we do the we do the, uh, the procedure, and then uh, the patient stays in an area uh, which is isolated until we have the result. And it will either go to the COVID area or uh, it can go to a non-COVID area. Just one comment that was mentioned: in some places they had separate COVID hospitals. In China, for instance, they did that. In in uh, here, what we did was actually to have, particularly for the big hospitals. We have a clear separation of COVID areas and no non-COVID uh, areas. So what we call clean areas and COVID areas. And uh, uh, and that was actually a very important exercise because we we would separate the different pathways, circuits of the patients, patient flow, and so on, uh, and, and even personnel. That there will be no mixing. Of course, you can never guarantee 100, percent but uh, um, that was done very in a I would say in a very efficient way. And uh, uh, if you cannot have a totally separate COVID hospital, um, because even if you have an, a, a clean hospital, you never know if you're going to have some patients there that you don't, you, don't, you have not tested yet, unless you have a good screening system beforehand, which might be difficult from a practical standpoint. So what we have done here, and I know in other places they've done the same, is actually to separate the circuits and, and have clear pathways for COVID, pathways for non-COVID and kind of the gray areas where you have the patients that are still waiting for results or where you, you're not sure um, if they should go one way or the other. But they have separate pathways and that actually helped to minimize the number of infected people and, uh, um, and also to create trust in the population that they will be separate uh, and there will be separation between infected and non-infected uh, part of the hospital. Thank you, thank you. Before I move on to another question from Dr. Mansoor Ahmad, I will really request Mr. Vini Chaudhary to stay on because I, we have to have some songs later on. But there is a question from Mansoor Ahmad from Pakistan. But before that, I will request Dr. Yashwar Sharma, who is a, our friend from Chandigarh, uh, to have some comments or if any question. He is the head of the Department of Cardiology in PGI. Postgraduate Institute of Cardiology is an important, eminent place uh, in India and research, and is heading the Department of Cardiology there. So, may I request Dr. Shpal Sharma to have some comments or some questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. Vivek. Very excellent uh, this webinar as earlier, and very nice lecture. Although I joined a bit late, I was listening to Dr. Fatshpal. Dr. Fatshpal came to PGI and uh, Batra Hospital with the experience of COVID-1 and MERS cardiogenic shock more than 1,000 patient experienced. This, uh, we, are, we have written to Indian Heart Journal also and this uh, European Society we are also writing to BA. Last time also told, we have to review our guidelines because the majority of the patients are infected. And if during infection, if we go for primary angioplasty, the mortality is 70 to 80 percent in ST elevation. And in non ST elevation, also 50 percent. If you give them thrombolysis, or those who are not even for thrombolysis, NSTMI presenting late, terofibin, and nicorandil, we, we treated four patients, and the patients they are recovering, becoming COVID negative. Although this COVID-1, we have a lot of patients. So we published late presenter of cardiogenic shock also in Indian Heart Journal. And the results are really better. The mortality 30 to 40 percent with all comorbid diseases. Even if, as I told earlier, in the primary PTI, if you see the patient, all patients with infection were excluded. Now the guidelines are telling that futile prognosis you should not interfere. So majority of these patients, they are having pneumonia, sepsis, other things. So we have to sparingly said 
that thrombolysis should be given to all patients. And this fear of this transmission, everything will get cleared because fourth, fifth day, the patient become negative if we treat them aggressively by seven days. And the virus culture is not showing any organism. That is after six, seven days, anti the infection is there. And WHO has said that treat the sepsis very early, which we were advocating early, that patients with cardiac diseases, they are very compromised. And if you treat them, not them aggressively in the beginning, they go into septic and cardiac shock. So that is our philosophy earlier also. We are writing to WHO also for this. We were advocating, telling in our clinical meetings everywhere. So far, this is our repeatedly lectures also in webinars also, here also, because the, it is not in the book, but rescue angioplasty and blanket thrombolysis, wherever indicated, where contraindicated, also go for terofibin moderate to high dose. Here, APTT has to be kept 2.5 times with heparin. So this is very hypercognitive state. In bleeding, the bleedings are not there. There is a total thrombosis. And thrombosis in prostate, mesenteric, brain, cerebral, coronary. So here, pathology is different. And what I remember, we are doing all angiography, angioplasty, our previous one. There is a total thrombus burden with no reflow used to occur. Those are the cases. If you give thrombolysis after do, thrombus burden is so less, you do angioplasty as normal. So this will change the whole scenario of cardiology if we review our guidelines critically and see everything. So everything, life of cardiologists, patient, healthcare workers, our health industry, everything will improve. So just we have to click a button towards thrombolysis and changing our strategy from primary angioplasty to sparingly angioplasty, which we have written today also to Indian Journal, uh, giving reference of American guidelines, European guidelines, Chinese guidelines, very critical. We today have seminar with our all fellow colleagues. So they were connected PGI Illumina also today at 11, uh, 12 o'clock, 12 to 2 o'clock. So my this one submission is review our guidelines very this one jointly, not American, European, Chinese, all sit together in a webinar and critically analyze. So that will be the change of scenario of our healthcare system and economy. Thank you. Hello. 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 And uh, now I request Dr. Mansoor, you have some question which came on the chat. So you can yeah. ask the question directly. He's a cardiologist from Pakistan, Karachi, our great friend. He's a very experienced person. He's himself doing some webinars for Pakistan Cardiology of India. So please ask a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's... Can you hear me? Please? I can hear you. But there's a lot of uh, uh, maybe feedback issue. Yeah, I think it's very difficult. Yeah, I think it's very difficult. Yeah, I think it's very difficult. Yeah, I think it's very I think it's a little oh, the sound is echoing. present discussion. It's nothing to do with cardiology as such, but it's been intriguing me a lot lately. That, uh, what is going on? Uh, the number of cases are increasing all over the world, but the mortality is so variable in different regions. I thought maybe it's age, higher the age, higher the mortality. And that may explain uh, the lower mortality in South Asia. But then, what about Germany, where the population is as old as anywhere else? So I was just wondering, is there any postulated hypothesis or something or any good guess on this? Okay. Europe. Okay. Europe. Okay. He says, why there is a difference in mortality in various locations? Well, we, in fact, we, we, we don't know. Well, of course, some things are obvious. If you have a better health system, um, it's easier to accommodate some of these patients, and uh, like the German system, um, but uh, also the way the, um, there is a problem because the way the deaths are registered, it varies a little bit from country to country. The definition of a death by COVID, there was actually a complaint by the Belgium uh, uh, government or health entities saying that they were basically considering everybody. Uh, so they, they, they will have a much higher rate of uh, mortality, and it's true. Um, but, uh, so that's one explanation, is the level of the health system. And of course, if you cannot admit, if you don't have enough ICU beds or ICU space for these patients, it's going to be uh, dramatic. 
The other thing we don't know is why some patients apparently not belonging to some of the, 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 risk, the risky groups, they develop severe disease. We don't know yet. You know, the, uh, we do know that there are some that fit into the, into the, the, the high risk, but also you, we've had patients here perfectly normal without previous disease, anything, and they went into very severe disease. And it's not still unclear, probably at some to do with some genetics, there's some data showing that probably that may, may play a role, but we don't know yet. But uh, sure, this is the, the main reason why we cannot go into herd immunity uh, strategy. Because it's going to be the number, and that's what happened in Lombardy, Italy, very good health system, but unable to accommodate all those patients. That's what happened in New York, what happened in some other parts of the world, you know, where you had such a, a, a number of patients coming in that no system can accommodate that. And, uh, and many people died because basically they, they could not be treated in reality. The other thing was, um, uh, um, in terms of, in some parts, in terms of uh, uh, the way old people was treated, um, and the, the, there were some uh, places where some of these people were staying, and a lot of people actually died in this in these places, and uh, and the, in some countries there was not a lot of, uh, I would say, care with, and some people, old people, actually died without even coming to the hospital. So we don't have all the answers, but uh, uh, these are just some of the reasons why you may see some discrepancy between some of the countries. But the main one, uh, and that's why we need to have some drastic measures to reduce the number of people infected, because otherwise, if you have this kind of av avalanche of tsunami of people, then no system in the world can, even the best one, can accommodate all these patients. Vivek, I have to leave now. Um, I have uh, another meeting now, and um, I really want to uh, thank you very much for this very kind invitation. It was a real pleasure to be here with all these colleagues. I, I've been many times in India, and I, I, I want to go back, so I hope the travel will be <laughs> open soon. Uh, but I really enjoy it very much, and um, I think this is the way that we as doctors like to communicate not not only like this, of course, we like also to be face to face. But I mean, discussing, showing different uh, um, ideas, and also discussing some things that can help us all of us to treat better our patients, because that's at the end what we want to do to the best. For all. I request him to please say a few words before Doctor Pinto goes away, and then we have discussion further. You're always welcome, Professor Pinto. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, can you uh, speak, Ashokan? Please speak. Yes, Ashokan, go ahead. No, no. Can Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. So, uh, one or two questions, and uh, see, there's a difference between leave. European guidance. Okay, and the okay. uh, uh, guidelines uh, actually prepared by CSI and the recommendation from ACC. All of them agree that STEMI patients manage STEMI patients a challenging task for cardiologists. And all patients should get a standard treatment care as an emergency procedure. Not a, no difference in this. The difference is which patient should be taken up for angioplasty. What should be the outcome for the primary angioplasty in COVID STEMI patient versus non-COVID? Is there a difference in the outcome when you do angioplasty in a COVID patients? One. Second, we know that is if the coronary is normal after the angiogram, are we unnecessarily exposing the healthcare workers for the COVID infection? So these two things. Third one is, are we getting uh, STEMI patients late for this procedure? So what should be the outcome? Because these people are coming very late. Or there's a delay in doing the procedure because of logistic reasons. 
So these are the three questions. I'll just say very, very briefly that a lot of these things we don't know yet, in, in fact. <laughs> what we do here is that STEMI we take to the room because we don't know. So we take uh, every single STEMI, uh, COVID, we take to the room. And uh, uh, we, we did not have a lot, actually, to be honest, here in, the, in my hospital. Um, but if it is a STEMI, we don't hesitate. If it's a non-STEMI, we only take the high risk. <laughs> Compensates of, uh, and we not have a lot uh, uh, as well. So I think we we still don't know exactly. We do know some data that was shown that some of these patients they have angiographically normal coronary arteries. So it's more because of uh, the myocarditis like, and we know that that can be deleterious. But in my opinion, if it's a, a STEMI, clearly, I think we should take the patient into uh, into the cath lab. Uh, of course, with all the protections and all uh, uh, all the uh, what needs to be done, but I still will give the benefit of the doubt uh, in these patients. Um, the other ones, we it's unclear, you know. And the, again, the strategy is more in terms of compensate the patient, and if there is a decompensation, or do a later a delayed uh, invasive strategy. But uh, I think there is still a lot of unknown in the uh, in these type of patients. Now I really have to go, Vivek. Thank you so much. Really appreciate great meeting. Goodbye, dear friends from India. All the best. Namaste. Bye bye. Thank you. Namaste. <laughs> okay, so I have to uh, go switch on to uh, some other speaker because uh, we have a uh, doctor Hari Sharma. Uh, he just joined from Holland. Uh, so, would you like to speak something uh, before we start our uh, further program, Doctor Hari Sharma? Uh. Greetings from Netherlands to all of you. I, I'm sorry I couldn't I couldn't join you earlier. I was uh, hooked up, uh, and um, I just listened uh, very briefly uh, in the last uh, five eight minutes. So, um, if you have particular question related to Europe uh, or Netherlands, I would be happy to answer because I didn't uh, as I didn't hear others. So I wouldn't be able to comment on 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 anything on that. Um, one thing which I would like to add is that uh, Netherlands has done relatively well. Uh, we are um, our curve is uh, on decline um, with respect to the number of uh, cases, the number of hospital admittance admissions, and also the number of deaths uh, over the last uh, one week. Um, it's uh, the country is opening up, uh, but we are cautiously uh, working and using all our intellectual, what they call it, uh, uh, lockdown. So it means that using all the steps uh, which are necessary to, to prevent uh, further infections. So um, in, the, in the buildings, in, in, in the public transportation, the masks are only used in the public transportation, but the rest is all people are maintaining one and a half meter distance. Um, the driving in the cars and all that, it's, it's very routine. Um, things are becoming slowly, slowly um, to uh, so-called normal, but not really. Um, um, it's a lot of worrisome situation with respect to uh, the economy because all the uh, major public things are closed. Uh, uh, no proper class, no... Um, Games, sports, because uh, Netherlands is, is really a sport, a sporting country. So we don't have uh, all the sports. The, the the just some of the sport club are starting training uh, and and having them uh, with a distance uh, by putting uh, kind of boundaries. But I think it's not really. The gathers are all closed and the weather is improving as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I would add as far as the Holland is concerned. But uh, uh, I would be happy to take if uh, anybody has particular question related to the mechanism or uh, pathology or anything um, with respect to COVID. Yeah. Sorry. 
I think there is no uh, such question because we had a long discussion since uh, that oh, time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can I can imagine I can imagine because I I'm 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 really late uh, I I couldn't join you people earlier so I I thank for <laughs> recognizing me because I thought maybe if it is still going on so I was just trying my luck if you guys are still on I'll I'll go and have a look and uh, I just listened few things yeah yes. I thank uh, Dr. Sokhan Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. Gupta I mean, you guys are doing great uh, this is fantastic platform which you have created and and having really intellectual discussions and exchanging experiences i think this is this is very high time for uh, doing so yeah thank you very much uh, dr hari sharma i think before we we almost at the end of our session but there was a question which was asked i'm not able to see but i will answer myself there was a question to dr bc kalma from the dr mohan who was asking a question whether the patient has hypertension and if he has a miss beat what he should do is it related to covid so my question answer would be because dr kalma is not here i think he must be knowing him that's why he asked the question my answer to this is that miss beat is one or two miss beat per day is not a concern but of course whole time monitoring for three days or seven days or one day so will be a reasonable option and of course one has to rule out ischemia if at all there in the condition he should consult a cardiologist so i thought first of all i was like to summarize the whole thing this was a webinar 5 in the series of icr there we had uh, dr fasto pinto who is the president elect of world heart federation which i did not know and dr pp mohanan has told me along with dr fayaz shaw uh, we had a long discussion and then dr our minister honorable minister mr ramdas athavle had a social message followed by madam madhvi agrawal who is a bjp active worker from kolkata she had a, uh, a social message and dr pp mohanan and dr yashpal sharma dr raghu everybody dr shokan and yourself dr hari sharma we all had a, a good discussion and discussion the point and the learning and i am thankful and this was facebook live or two platforms one was from uh, my side from apollo hospital side not exactly but our facebook and secondly indians in paris where we had a, about 25000 uh, people and this was doc plexus so finally i want to thank doc plexus which is a platform with 3.8 lakhs indian doctors and they had done a live Uh, streaming of this on their website and this will be repeatedly on live so shown on the website for at least 2 3 4 days or 5 days so i thank dr kritika uh, dhingra who was there all through with us i think she's not available if she's there she can put her or put her uh, uh, video on just to say thank from our side and we the academic session is now over and doc plexus they can if they are interested they can put off the streaming Uh, if Dr. Kritika would like to say something before you leave, then we will have a small two three songs because it's very interesting. I think she is listening, but she is not able to put on the video. So I thank Doc Plexus to continue helping us. And next webinar will also be live on the doc doctor's platform. It's a very interesting thank platform. Yeah, thank so you, Dr. Vivek. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. And thank you to all the panelists who were a part of this discussion. Doc Plexus was really happy to have you on board, and uh, we've got a great response. Thank you so much for having there. Okay, thank you. Now we start our cultural program. Don't please go away. A lot of people are still Facebook live, and Dr. Vivek Chaudhary. I'm always thankful to him. Uh, last time also, he is a singer and a celebrity singer and fan of Amitabh Bachchan, and he's a very good, not only fan but he's a close touch with Mr. Amitabh Bachchan. and he goes to meet him 